Hello, everyone, and welcome to Leading Approaches to Solid Waste Management Regulation, the fourth of our six-part webinar series on environmental health and the water crisis. My name is Carla Blackmar, and I'm the project manager here at the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. I'm joined at the controls by Holly Calhoun, who is our Food Systems Working Group Coordinator here at PHA SoCal. We're keeping the audio lines open today because we want to hear from you during the Q&A and discussion section of our agenda. So throughout the call, you're going to be in charge of muting and unmuting yourself. You can do this um, using the console as shown. There's a uh, mute, unmute button that looks like a little <laughs> break. And it sounds like some folks might want to go ahead and hit that now. And you can also do that on your own home phone, too, if you're using a phone to dial in. If you're joining the audio via computer, you will need a microphone to speak into the audio on your computer. Uh, so make sure that's enabled if you are using a computer option. And if not, you can always join by telephone in addition to the computer. So you'll just need to enter the audio pin shown on your panel, which is, um, I don't think we have a slide of it here, but it will be visible in the audio section, the audio tab of your, of your panel on the right-hand side. Um, we are going to be, if you have any problems with the audio, go ahead and send us a question. And you can also submit questions for panelists um, during the presentations in the questions panel, which is shown in the bottom right of the slide that you're looking at right now. Uh, we're going to be recording today's webinar and we'll post the recording and presentation slides on our website. Please go ahead and share the link with interested colleagues who are unable to join today. And finally, I'd like to introduce Angelo Belomo, our Deputy Director of Health Protection for LA County, who will be kicking us off once again today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Holly and Carla, and thanks to all of you for joining us this morning, especially our colleagues in uh, environmental health. Before we begin um, to introduce our speakers, I want to just comment briefly to sort of set the context for our discussion. Our goal in this series of webinars over the last uh, couple of months has been first to understand the current water crisis and second uh, to discuss how those of us in environmental health can help to resolve it. Within California, as many of us know, in, in our Southern California region, that what is you know forming up as the challenge of the century is how do we develop a water system that provides adequate water and in a way that is sustainable indefinitely despite the periodic droughts that we experience in this region. Our part of this as environmental health professionals to help with the development of alternative water sources. So it's important to realize I think that environmental health jurisdictions as well as our colleagues in public health are not the driving force behind the development of alternative water. Others have brought this issue to us over time. But the question for us to think about is what is the role we can play in assisting the key stakeholders that are water municipalities and private water companies, public interest groups and other non-governmental organizations that are acting in the public interest and of course state and local regulators. How do we best support innovation in alternative water and how do we do that in a way that maintains the safety of our current water sources? That's always been the dual role that we have in environmental health to first ensure that we're protecting our existing potable water supplies but we have to branch off now given the ultimate primary role that an adequate water supply plays in our ability to maintain good health. So we have this dual role of both protecting our existing potable supplies, but also embracing and in fact promoting the development of alternative water. Now, um, let me just say a little bit about our two speakers. Um, Art, uh, <clears throat> Art Ludwig, Ludwig has 35 years of professional experience in the integrated design of systems for water, wastewater, energy, shelter, food production, transportation, and many other uh, type of projects. He's consulted with the states of New York, California, and New Mexico on building codes. His quantitative analysis of the health risks of gray water 
has cleared the way for more rational regulation of gray water in California. And I guess I would say that a lot of the recent breakthroughs in this area are due to the input that uh, ART has provided to regulators. He's developed some um, uh, original innovations that he has published, unpatented, released them into the public domain. So he's a real champion and promoter of all of this and does it in a very uh, forthright manner. And uh, one of his specialties is in laundry, laundry to landscape gray water systems, uh, which have, have in fact been adopted worldwide, incorporated into building codes, water conservation rebates, and federal job, job training programs. Art is the author of several books, including Water Storage, Principles of Ecological Design, and Create an, o an Oasis in Gray Water. Uh, in addition to Art, uh, a good colleague of mine, uh, Larry Fay, who is the Director of Environmental Health for Santa Barbara County, is also going to be with us this morning and will be making some remarks. Uh, Larry, uh, I, I deal routinely with about 60 environmental health directors just in the state of California, and I would have to say that Larry is one of the most uh, progressive in his thinking, and he's really setting a very good course for us, whether it's uh, making important changes to the food system uh, or the water system. He's been extremely um, helpful in that regard and, and is a leader in the state of California. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Art, and uh, we'll hear some very interesting uh, remarks from Art. Thanks, Angelo, and um, thanks also for all of you who are attending this morning, and thanks so much for the organizers of this remarkable series. It's, a, it's an honor to be part of this. Um, I always like to start with gratitude. Gratitude's a healthy thing. There are so many sources for this information at this point. I have to go by themes. Today's theme is men in high positions with whom I've had a productive mind meld about health of the built environment and policy. In every presentation I've got to acknowledge uh, what's probably the single biggest source of my understanding of water systems which is decades of close observation and study of natural systems. And there's a tremendous amount to be learned here. Uh, I cannot recommend enough getting out and looking at what's happening out in the world in both um, natural and man-made systems. You see me here deeply immersed in the study of one of nature's greatest mysteries, which is how is it that the bottom drain for 200 square miles covered with bear poop, rotting carcasses, assorted filth on the surface, is pristine drinking quality water. What is going on here? This is what our bottom drains look like. So how is nature pulling this off? And the answer to this mystery is central to today's topic, and we'll be circling back to that. Drought is certainly a major issue right now, but it's just one of many interconnected crises. Besides water, we have climate, energy, food production, biodiversity, wildfire, transportation, just a whole net of interconnected crises. This perfect storm of crises is in part rooted in an epidemic of specialization. Optimizing these elements in isolation tends to pessimize the whole system. What we need is more systems thinking, and I think that environmental health professionals may be the best poised to facilitate this. What this looks like is designing for all the relevant factors at once, not just drought, but also flood, fire, climate, food production, transportation, economy. And that's how you get overall best health. I call this practice optimal integrated design. It involves taking every factor into account, adapting the design to the context. This is not uniform code. This is context specific and appropriate. Optimizing the connections between the systems, often it makes it, the connections uh, require and reward more, more attention than the systems themselves. Plan for all probable future conditions, we're in rapidly changing conditions, and that's the way to achieve the highest overall outcome and the highest overall health. 
Uh, historically, the factors that have been taken into account with respect to the safety of the built environment revolve around current occupant safety, fire, structural soundness, sanitation. And focusing just on these can lead to some unwanted external effects. We've got to also consider off-site impacts, carbon emissions, manufacturing-related toxins, extraction-related impacts, future impacts, etc. Um, whoops, let's see if I can get this back down here. Um, adding more plastic pipe helps improve health and sanitation up to a point, but if you add too much plastic pipe, then you have an ex you, you pass the overall optimum and you end up with more off-site impacts such as the fire at this PVC plant. Building with more wood makes structures more fire or more earthquake safe, but you pass a certain point if you take down all the trees where you end up with a negative part of the curve for overall environmental health with things like this landslide and so on. Um, adding more concrete makes buildings more hurricane resistant, but it also makes hurricanes stronger. So to have the best overall health, you have to take all of these factors into account. Um, we've been optimizing for current occupant safety at the expense of the uh, sustenance of Earth's life support systems and the well-being of future generations and current non-occupants. Unfortunately, this configuration is made stable by the fact that this coincides with the point of short-term revenue maximization. And there's a lot of revenue streams which are vigorously defended um, in large part with uh, standards and laws uh, that require things to be a certain way. And I think that it's a good time for environmental health professionals to channel their inner Pope Francis and shift things over to the balance between all these factors, which coincides with the point of optimum safety. Um, I'd like to look at a little, uh, I'd like to encourage you to think about systems thinking and try this exercise in your work of just listing the factors that you're considering. For example, if you're facing a situation with not enough water, the uh, simplified response without looking at all the factors might be to borrow money for a desal plant if you're in coastal California, burn more cheap fossil fuel. The result would be you'll definitely have more water, um, but it also enables the waste that is a big part of the problem that we have to continue, for example, by subsidizing lawn watering, uh, often to the tune of over $500 per year per lawn with base rate funds that are extracted from water conserving households. These things are so expensive, they starve conservation and alternate supply of funds. The water is too expensive to grow food, which creates its own cascading effect. And of course, the main thing is it makes the droughts worse because it generates almost a gallon of CO2 per gallon of water. Um, might be interesting to think about having a joint environmental health declaration against desalination. Um, looking at the uh, wider list of factors, see that the underlying issue is that the bill for centuries of carbon dumping is now coming due. Climate damage is ex increasing exponentially. Water budgets are getting harder to balance. Groundwater is running out. There's also less recharge because the water is coming down faster and the land is less permeable when it's, uh, part, when it's built on. And also because the water is coming down faster, there's insufficient storm drain capacity. I like the idea of uh, water bombs. That's the first time I'd heard that from Linda earlier in this series. The response then might be to first account for all the water where it's going, eliminate most of the remaining waste. There's quite a lot. Uh, we use about 15 gallons a day per capita indoors in our house. Uh, average is 50, conservative is considered to be 35, and yet there's still about 20% of waste in there that, that I'm aware of, and that's without even looking at changing habits. I think it's time to look at re-landscaping California to capture and infiltrate stormwater. 
uh, for example, converting lawns to stormwater harvesting basins with fruit trees. The result of this would be less water demand because of getting rid of the waste, more water supply because of capturing the stormwater, less flood damage, again, from capturing the stormwater, less climate disruption, and more local food production. I'd like to turn now to gray water systems. Some of you may have seen this. Uh, this is one of Santa Barbara's most uh, historic and prominent gray water systems. It's the Mission Lavanderia, where the laundry water fed uh, the corn in front of the Mission historically. Gray water systems are the residential systems thinking gateway. Uh, gray water is the most interconnected and the most context sensitive of any of the ecological systems that people contemplate for their homes. So of the menu of ecological actions that includes solar hot water, passive solar, composting toilets, all the, every practice you can think of, if you ranked those by interconnectedness and then ranked them again by context sensitivity, gray water would be at the top of both of those lists. So it's a very educational system to engage with. Happily, it is also a very low stakes sandbox for people to learn about systems thinking. And I'll revisit this in a moment. Uh, the, some of you may know the one universal rule that applies to all gray water system installations. It's that there are no universally applicable rules. Every single thing has its asterisks. Um, salt is not a good idea to have in gray water. Asterisks, unless you live where there's lava tubes and you get more than a meter of rain a year, then it's absolutely not a problem. Storage of gray water, bad idea. Asterisks, unless it's treated, and so on. Makes it very complicated to write a book on gray water. The general law of gray water regulation, I think, is that whatever you think is going to happen, the opposite of the obvious is what will happen. This diagram shows the workflow for getting a fully optimized residential gray water system. You have to coordinate a whole host of different things in the course of tuning together fixture flow rates, user habits, rainwater, stormwater, green waste, plant selection and location, all for your particular soil and site conditions. As I mentioned, fortunately, this is a low stakes endeavor. While there is a big upside, in part by saving water, but mainly from fostering systems thinking that then propagates through the rest of people's lives and the community, there's very little downside. Even if someone fails at every one of these things, it's more of a missed opportunity than actual damage. It appears to be almost impossible to get yourself sick with great water in practice, no matter how stupid your system is. There's approximately 1.7 million gray water systems in California. How do we know that? Well, it turns out that the number one question to 1-800-ASK-TIDE is, is this stuff going to kill my plants? Procter & Gamble, with their half billion dollar a year R&D budget, sent out a survey to, I believe, 13,000 U.S. households to try and find out what the heck people were doing with their laundry water. And uh, they found that the highest percentage of it uh, anywhere in the country was being reused for gray water here in California, almost 14%. And this correlates also with door-to-door -door surveys that we've done and with a survey in Arizona. Um, this has resulted in 184 million gray water system use, user years of exposure, plus or minus. Actually, doesn't really matter how accurate these numbers are if they're off by a factor of two or even a factor of five. It doesn't really change the conclusions. I'll let you be the, your own judge of that. Um, gray water prohibition has created the most extreme possible manifestation of the situation it was intended to avoid. This is the per perfect example of the um, opposite outcome principle. In the United States, there are 8 million unpermitted systems that have resulted in a billion gray water system user years of exposure. Virtually none of these conform to the California Code. Less than 1 in 10,000 have been inspected. Almost none of them have been professionally installed. And many were built with almost no outside guidance of any kind. The way that I know that is we've been the premier providers of outside guidance via our books and website 
for, oh gosh, 20 plus years now. Um, we've sold, I don't know, a few hundred thousand of these books. Uh, and, and, you know, we're also the Greywater confessors to the nation. We hear about everybody's systems when they call us up. And I had the impression that we were making almost no headway at all for the first 10 years, although now I feel like it is gaining steam. There's some sort of tipping point. Um, and now the, the practice is noticeably better. This, the results of this massive experiment was basically proof that gray water is a relatively insignificant transmission route. Apparently, if someone in the house is infectious, you're more likely to catch what they have through some other means besides gray water. So if you're breathing the same air, using the same dishes, sleeping in the same bed, changing the diapers, the fact that the water is daylighting for two inches before going in the mulch under the orange tree is not a significant factor. Uh, it's hard to prove that something didn't exist, doesn't exist. Uh, there is one possible mechanism of the 13 uh, diseases that were identified by the Water Environment Resor Research Foundation as potentially gray water transmissible. Nine of these are reportable. Of those, there have been approximately 5 million reported cases in the past 60 years. Uh, we've tried hard to track uh, to see if there was any get, you know, accounts of gray water linked to transmission with CDC and various health departments and get a consistent result of zero cases linked to gray water. Um, at a modest residential scale, it's easy to imagine that the holes in the net are small enough that some infections can it slip through. Um, but the more extreme version of these systems are pretty extreme, you know, Boy Scout camp with kitchen sink water from 200 kids going down the hill on the surface, built at the turn of the century, that sort of thing. And you can bet that if there was an outbreak attributable to that, that it would show up in the record. Gray water appears to be relatively innocuous in reality. It's got on the order of a thousandth less pathogens than combined wastewater. And purification at the surface is incredibly potent. There are orders of magnitude more beneficial bacteria and plant root hairs at the very surface than even a foot down and, uh, and, the, and 10 feet down and so on. So the plume from, uh, of contamination from a gray water system at the very surface is an order of magnitude smaller than that from a septic tank or a septic leach field that is say three feet down, which in turn is an order of magnitude smaller than that of a, um, what I call a groundwater poison injection system, a dry well that's say 50 feet down. Um, even water running right over the surface of the ground itself without getting into the ground, the nightmare scenario, you know, of water going over someone's backyard and down into a creek, it turns out that the same uh, biological activity that's so potent in the top inch or so, top foot of topsoil, also is very active at the very surface itself. Um, this fascinating table shows removal rates for wastewater treatment facilities that broadcast um, effluent in sprinklers at loading rates of up to six inches a day over the surface of uh, very impermeable grassland and then collect it like 50 feet further down. And you can see there's very high removal rates. So this is the answer to this question of how the heck natural surface waters are so clean. The mechanism behind this is so elegant that I couldn't resist putting in a few slides on it. Uh, it takes wastewater a few hours to a few weeks to pass through a foot of soil. Slow passage through one foot of healthy topsoil removes 90% plus of the pathogens. In that cubic foot of topsoil, there are 1.5 million square feet of treatment area, area. It's not a misprint. Three trillion beneficial bacteria and a whole host of other biological complexity that works at converting pathogens into plant nutrients from every possible angle. There's enough root hairs to wrap around the perimeter of the entire continental United States. And along those root hairs, there are countless specialized proteins which pumps 
target nutrient molecules through the roots hair, uh, root hair cell walls. These things are fascinating little machines. There's one for every nutrient, one for phosphate, one for nitrate, and so on. They're huge, powerful, complex molecules, identically constructed from tens of thousands of items out of atoms. They're fantastically elegant with a precise function. Um, each of the little indices in this computer model is an atom. These things are ginormous. They electrochemically attract, for example, a nitrate molecule out of the soil solution, boom, into a receptor site where it fits like a key into a lock, and then this whole thing folds over and pumps the nitrate against an enormous concentration gradient uh, from the soil into the cell. Compared to the elegance of a protein pump, the activated sludge, an activated sludge treatment plant looks like a very blunt instrument. It turns out that even the most humble gray water system is fully optimized for uh, effective wastewater treatment. Every factor is working for it, all the way down to, for example, higher temperature with uh, bath water coming out of this into the bananas, it's still warm and the biological activity will be faster. Bottom line is you get back to pure drinking water in a very short distance. So even these simplest of gray water systems have very sophisticated systems engineering because nature is doing most of the work. Uh, engineers are uh, in part creeped out by these systems because the, the complexity is just so beyond understanding. Uh, but you don't need to understand the mechanics of everything that's going on. You can just see what's actually working, which is how uh, great water systems have mostly been developed is empirically. I want to turn now to uh, per the question of proportional response and usage of regulatory resources and the dual role that Angelo alluded to of environmental health directors. Um, in engineering speed limits, there's this 85th percentile method, which reflects the collective judgment of the vast majority of drivers as to a reasonable speed for given traffic and roadway conditions. It also aligns with the policy sentiment that laws should not make people acting reasonably into lawbreakers. In the dual function of environmental health professionals, safety and promotion of alternate water sources, Gray water turns out to be an area where you can relax quite a bit more than you'd think on safety and let people try things out. Looking at our current way of regulating gray water, how are these 14 pages of standards working out? Well, in California prior to 2009, the compliance rate was approximately 1 in 10,000. If there's a rule that's been less successful, I cannot think of what it is. This is just a spectacularly uh, high failure rate. Since 2009, with the advent of uh, permit-exempt laundry-only systems, that's climbed to perhaps 1%. If you discount the two most unrealistic laundry-only provisions, it's probably 50%. So that's an enormous uh, improvement there. It's interesting to look at where these standards came from. Uh, multiple basins have up to 100 times the long-term acceptance rate of leach fields, and unlike septics, there's, a, there's information on our website to substantiate that if you're curious about it. Unlike septics, gray water systems are required to have a 100% backup system, yet the loading rates in the gray water code are just copied over from the septic code. They're literally identical. Gray water has at least 1,000 times less pathogens than septic effluent and is applied to a part of the soil column that's 10 to 100 times more, uh, has 10 to 100 times more purification capacity. But again, the setbacks are virtually identical in the septic code as for the gray water code. So you kind of get the feeling there was not a lot of science or thought that went into this. Um, from the layman's eye view, the code basically looks like BS. I had a large role in um, writing the code and spent a huge amount of time with it and I'm kind of a nerd to it but everyone you know I often run into people that are seeing it for the first time and it just does not connect with reality at all which is a fact that's not helped by the fact that industry has an outsized influence on these regulations what I saw in Sacramento is that industry wrapped themselves in the cloak of public safety while mandating profit 
benefits and externalizing costs. The gray water code is by no means the most egregious example of that. I think that that might go to fracking being exempt from the Clean Water Act. Um, regulators and policymakers are key operators in this war and um, I think it's important as public health officials to think about which what it is you want to support here. Uh, at this point, just a few more years of pillaging the commons at this critical time would have enormous consequences for the future. So again, I think it might be a good time to channel uh, Pope Francis. Um, years of crying wolf on great water has created a major new hazard, which has reduced credence for regulations. Uh, credibility and reliable guidance is needed now more than ever for the massive reorganization of our systems in response to climate change. It's important that people trust the rules. Um, the gray water horse is out of the barn. Promoting best practices can only make things better. Is there a better way? Well, this is the entire code. That's it. You're looking at it for 99% of the gray water systems in Arizona. I talked with Chuck Graff, the author of this, uh, just the other day. He explained that in Arizona prior to 2001, their compliance rate was approximately 1 in 30,000, even worse than California. And uh, he set out to make a reality-based code, and now the compliance rate is about 70%. Everybody loves these standards, and um, they are trusted as a source of guidance. Uh, that would be 23,000 times improvement in compliance with almost zero expenditure of regulatory resources, which are then freed up to do other more weighty things. Um, and al also a lot of trust has been built here. Um, can we do this in California? Well, you want to talk about this part, Larry? Sure, I'll jump in, Art. Um, this is kind of interesting from an environmental health perspective because the permitting authority uh, for gray water systems in California rests with the unified plumbing code and the building officials are the point people for uh, overseeing gray water programs, gray water permitting, gray water systems. So we're in a situation where we could just sit back and say not our problem. Um, they don't come to see us, we don't need to worry about it. But as, as Art alluded to, we do have a, as environmental health professionals a very strong interest in our water resources. We have a strong interest in assuring that the way water is managed and used is protective of the community and public health. And while risks are low, um, there is concern about what people may or may uh, do with their gray water in a wild and woolly west. And as Art already alluded to, um, for the most part, we have a body of rules and regulations um, that are not being Followed. So I, I wanted to talk just shortly or briefly about kind of the, the inherent conflict of the way the plumbing code is written right now, and then a little bit about what we are discussing here in Santa Barbara County with a number of the building officials. Um, first, the plumbing code, I think, establishes a clear policy statement that gray water systems are desirable um, and, and ought to be promoted, and that the plumbing code actually... I'm going to put that back on the screen. Go ahead. plumbing code actually prohibits... Um, a local uh, jurisdiction or does not allow a local jurisdiction to prohibit gray water systems. It, it says that gray water systems shall be permitted. Then it goes on to say that um, all gray water systems, actually all alternative water systems, um, require a construction permit and allows a couple of exceptions. One, one exception that's in code is the laundry systems we've already talked about. But there's two places where the code allows a local building official to exempt gray water systems from permitting at all, and that's for their uh, simple and complex systems. Now, if you're going to use gray water in the, uh, for, for uh, internal plumbing in the home, there is no uh, even allowable exemption, and that probably stands to, to reason because you're talking about something that's considerably more complex and risky. But having said that, the thing that strikes me, and Art and I have talked about this, you know, why do we have this situation in Santa Barbara County, third year of drought, water uh, shortages in the headlines, Montecito having their problems. Why are we not seeing a flood of folks coming in for uh, permits for gray water systems? When I met with the county building official a couple of weeks ago, in the last two years, he hasn't seen a single application. 
uh, interesting, the day we were meeting, uh, a gentleman came into our office and dropped off an application for a gray water system. He was even in the wrong place. Um, so, so there's a lot of confusion about what's going out there. But when you look at the plumbing code, it allows the building official to exempt uh, the, the great, the, both the complex and simple systems from permitting or construction permitting requirements. So we look at this as a why apparently permits are a significant barrier to the public. You know, they're not coming in to get them, yet we know they're doing gray water systems. Art can, can verify that for us. Um, we look at the permits and think even, you know, we'll put together a real simple system, over the counter, whatever else, but apparently for the public there's no perceived value in getting a permit and no downside to not getting a permit. That's the way the system's actually working right now. And uh, so we said, so what's it all in there for? And there is a place for exemptions. So uh, I started a conversation with a couple of the building officials about whether or not they want to exercise the authority they have around exempting these from permitting and focus more on getting good, plain English and simple guidance out to folks to try to guide the people that are doing these anyway into doing a, a better job of design and installation of gray water systems without necessarily a normal um, sort of uh, permitting and inspection approach to things. As we talked to building officials, two things kind of came up, maybe three things about the exemption. One is um, they don't have any criteria for considering when and how they would exempt a system. The policy, the state policy, all it is you have to have a permit. So they feel like they're going out on a limb if they were to say we're going to exempt certain categories um, of um, systems from permitting even though we have the authority to do that. The second, I think, and this is where as public health folks we can work with the building officials, is uh, the assurance that if they were to go down the path of exemption and if we were to follow general and reasonable standards, we are not uh, setting up a situation where we are greatly compromising public or community health or environmental quality. And I think they look to us as the people to guide them in that kind of uh, qualitative assessment of their program. And the third, and this is I think the most common bureaucratic response to these kinds of things is, what if I exempted somebody and something went wrong? I think that's the big fear that bureaucrats have whenever they're given this kind of discretionary authority. So they take the inherently conservative position and say, okay, I need, you know, you need to get a permit. And the bottom line again is nobody's getting permits. That's borne out by the numbers. So uh, we have talked with them about uh, setting up a policy framework that shifts the discussion from uh, allowable exemption to just making a clear statement that they're exempt. Imagine if the plumbing code, instead of saying um, you have to have a construction permit except the building official may exempt certain systems, if the plumbing code said um, you can put in the system and the plumbing official may require a permit. That's a significantly different dynamic, I think, um, and it would enable the plumbing, uh, the plumbing official, building official, to look at a situation and say, you know, under some certain circumstances, a permit adds value and is, is necessary, but give them the permission to basically allow these simple systems to go forward. Just as a historical note, that actually was the case in California for a brief interlude when the uh, emergency rulemaking on gray water went into effect in 2009. And it, it was, um, you know, kind of a, a contested thing um, uh, and uh, but HCD was willing to do exactly what you said and it ended up being uh, pushback from powerful industry lobbyists that I don't even know what horse they had in this race but um, that that's why that is not the case um, in all of California um, but I think we, we might get back to that so and, and that would be good if we could to take some other changes to the code, but but simply put, we have um, we have sat down with a couple of our building officials now, City of Santa Barbara and the County of Santa Barbara, and there is has been some um, I think strong interest in looking at 
uh, a kind of unified approach to exempting categories of gray water systems from permit requirement. And the interesting thing is, once we were able to get one building official to say, yeah, I think I can do this, a couple of the others, or at least one of the others that was reluctant said, oh, well, if he's ready to do this, we could get on board too. So what we have begun to work on is a policy framework that, are, that outlines um, in, in clear terms what systems would be exempt from construction permit requirements, build uh, very simple, plain English um, guidance documents around how to design and construct these things, figure out which water agency we're going to use to host gray water standards, I guess we'd call them, get all of the folks that are permitting coordinated and um, their technical information directed to the same location so that we're all working off of the same set of materials and guidance and see if we can't actually get into a role where our policies are in line and supportive of the, of the idea of uh, promoting safe gray water use as opposed to um, uh, having a system in place that assures that installation and um, use is going to be uh, underground and um, largely secretive. Uh, so what Art has posted up is the policy framework that we have proposed. There's quite a bit more work to do. Um, working with the two building officials in particular right now to get the buy-in, we have third available and our vision is once we've got three on board, I think it'll be easy for us to bring the other major jurisdictions in the community uh, in line with that. Um, the, the interest is there. I think it's kind of creating the environment that makes people feel safe in pursuing it. Um, the way that Larry put this yesterday is once one person breaks out of the corral, it'll be easy for the others to follow. <laughs> <laughs> so, so from my standpoint, the thing is, you know, as, as policy folks, as regulators, I think the, the level of intervention that we impose on folks ought to be com commensurate with the risk that we're exposing people to. And as Art has, has shown, you know, we're really talking about low risk situation, but we have a 14 page set of rules that are really quite complicated to sort through and in some cases um, very conservative and really fly in the face of, of um, what do I want to say, public common sense. We, I think, often understand why things are in the code, but the layperson looks at this and says, what? And, and I think that's what we're faced with a lot with the gray water stuff, and I think that's one of the reasons we're looking at a pretty high uh, disregard for the rules that exist. They're just impractical and unworkable for many uh, homeowners. So, I, th I think there's some, that? yeah, there's some, I think uh, building officials could take comfort in the intent statement at the beginning of the gray water code. I tried to get it up on the screen there earlier. Uh, but this this exemption would bring things into the in line with the intent stated in the gray water code itself um, there are a few I made a few other notes as you were talking where environmental health officials don't have permitting authority over these in California I think they have moral authority and uh, I think that you know r really the biggest health issue with gray water is loss of respect for the code and people turning their back on it as a source of guidance uh, which you know could then cause mistakes to be made in areas that are more consequential like co cross connections with rain, rain indoor rainwater reuse for example um, I don't think people need to worry much about indoor gray water reuse it makes I haven't seen anything that remotely makes sense uh, so I don't think that's a big priority, um, but I think you know rebuilding trust for the code is is a big priority. And uh, you know if people see things in you know the gray water code is something where people can understand they, they they know it they, you know they grew up in a house that had a gray water system, uh, you know they saw that it wasn't a problem and then they see all this stuff in the code and they're just like this just doesn't make any sense. And then if they see a thing that says don't use a three way valve. Uh, to switch from rainwater to potable water, they might not think that makes sense either. Um, I just want to explain what this slide is that's up here now. This 
is the conversion from uh, the gallons per day uh, to bedrooms. The, the CPC has the, the limits, um, the breakdown between the systems in terms of gallons per day, and we thought that it was more simple to, or easier to understand if it was in terms of bedrooms. Um, interestingly, the way that it's written, the CPC allows a permit exempt nine bedroom house with a uh, 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 sand filtration computer controlled. Um, that's all a simple system as long as it uses less than 250 gallons per day. Um, so this excludes that. This Our tier system mirrors the Arizona code more and uh, draws the line a little bit more conservative actually than uh, the CPC uh, for the exempt systems. The guidelines, which Larry alluded to, um, we're working on a draft of that that's based largely on, on the Arizona guidelines, but then brought into conformance with the California Plumbing Code. And these guidelines, once you've kind of won people's trust by having the thing generally make common sense, it's a good opportunity to nudge people away from known pitfalls. For example, um, people hacking into their own house plumbing. Um, it's not always done in the most elegant way. I haven't seen it done in a hazardous way, um, but you know it could like result in clogging and so on. So the guidelines are a good opportunity to say, hey, just get a professional plumber to do the, the collection plumbing within the house envelope. Um, and the advantages of this approach, it's a better use of regulatory resources, rebuilds the relationship with the citizenry, the credibility that we've talked about. And this is a key point. The only leverage that the code has, there's no leverage with homeowners, one in 10,000 compliance rate. However, with building professionals, there is leverage because professionals are reluctant to work on unpermitted systems. So again, this is an illustration of the opposite outcome principle trying to make the systems be better by having these you know, very complex codes has stopped professionals from installing systems. And, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll add right in here, Art, that there's really, uh, probably, probably more than one, but there's really one uh, significant player in, in gray water systems in the state that is out getting permits. Uh, he's figured out the systems he's doing, and apparently he can convince his clients that, yeah, you want to do permits. He's also doing a system that involves pumps and filters and things, so it may be appropriate that he's actually coming in. But uh, and, and it costs enough that, it, you know, if, you, if you're installing a ten or $15,000 system, then the effort and expense that it takes to comply with those 14 pages of standards makes sense. If you're just running... Uh, you know, a one-inch polyethylene line from your washing machine to your plants, it does not make sense to go through the permitting process. Um, the, the laundry exemption has provided an interesting uh, ex, uh, experiment in California, and what we've seen is that the stock of gray water systems has improved dramatically um, directly by professional installations, there's workshops, there's uh, uh, information from water districts. Um, there's 20 plus water districts in California that provide rebates for these systems. And then also indirectly, even the people who are doing the one-off DIY systems, they're in an environment that's infused with information and examples of actual best practices. Um, and then I think that Maybe the biggest advantage is it's along the lines of the systems thinking one. It, it prepares citizens for a more active role in managing resources that's going to be more and more important going forward. And, um, and this, is a, this is an educationally rich and safe environment to, um, uh, to explore, uh, you know, for people to explore the systems thinking and, and taking more responsibility for their water. Um, we're almost to the questions segment. I just wanted to mention that while, uh, much as gray water is the residential systems thinking gray water or, or systems thinking gateway, stormwater is the municipal systems thinking gateway. And um, 
this will be a story for another day, uh, but this is um, a, a really important thing to opportunity uh, community wide uh, is stormwater. So the things I'm hoping you'll remember, practice systems thinking, consider all the relevant factors, try the exercise of write, writing down the factors that are being considered, teach systems thinking, help others to consider more factors and to pay attention to the context, facilitate the adoption of policy exempting simple gray water systems from permit in your jurisdiction and as Larry mentioned statewide, and just in general to facilitate adaptation in a rapidly changing climate and I think there's going to be a lot of unprecedented challenges and opportunities coming shortly. Um, these are some of the books that we publish. We just came out with a brand new uh, revision of the Builders Gray Water Guide that has a lot of the charts and info and has uh, uh, the codes with um, extensive annotation. Um, that's uh, actually coming from the printer today. Um, and then we've got these laundry to landscape DVDs that are like a toolkit in a box for uh, homeowners or landscapers to install these things. And then apart from that, there's another 500 pages of info on our website. And with that, I think it's time to open it up to questions. Wow, thank you guys so much. That was a, a you make a pretty compelling case. Uh, so this is <clears throat> Carla Blackmar again, and um, I just wanted to open it up and see if any of our uh, participants had any questions initially. And again, you are in charge, by and large, of your own mute and unmute button with a few exemptions, um, but you should be able to unmute yourself. And if not, go ahead and put a question in the chat box. Um, just to get things started off, um, you know, people have, I guess, the plumbing industry, I mean, I think one of the things that you bring to this art is, an ex is experience actually doing installation and sort of seeing what, you know, as you said, being the confessor for um, gray water systems everywhere. And I guess, do you feel that there's um, the capacity within the plumbing industry to go ahead and do some of this type of work where we do change the um, permitting system a bit? The, the capacity, I actually don't do that many installations, which is kind of nice because it puts me at this sort of neutral ground between all these different factions. So I don't have, in theory, my hands sullied with actual gray water. Um, I, you know, what we, we're providers of accurate information. Um, I don't think that, uh, so what we recommend to people is they use plumbers for the collection plumbing. And it's actually landscapers that, uh, that, can and should have the capacity to do um, the main coordination of, of the installations. So the landscaper would put, you know, an X on the footing of the house and say, okay, you know, plumber, please get the water to here, uh, you know, four inches above grade. And then the plumber would take care of the inside part and then the landscaper would do it outside. And um, that capacity is rapidly being developed. Um, you know, what we've seen with, with the laundry systems is that, you know, from a standing start where you basically had zero landscapers, actually the system didn't even exist. I developed it in uh, 2008. Um, so uh, there was no information about it in 2008. And now, uh, you know, there's hundreds of, workshops and uh, landscapers that are installing these things and uh, the experience base is rapidly building and I think if the uh, shower ex systems were exempted that we would see the same sort of improvement. That's great. So um, thank you for that and just to keep it moving along we have a quick question from um, Prodine Dean Zulkeek, and I'm sure I've completely just, you know, done a terrible job on your name. The question says, it's nearly impossible to track how many home water recycling systems exist in California, but in the 2009 UCLA Institute of Environment Regional Report Card, Yoram Cohen reports that if just 10% of Southern California homes reuse their gray, gray water, that savings would equal the output of a desalination plant. So 
seeing more of a comment there, but you know, again, some pretty powerful data supporting, um, you know, uh, some change in this in this policy in this regard. Yeah, I would concur with that. I think that those numbers make sense. That's great. Thank you for that, and I'm sorry for doing a bad job on your name. Um, did you have a few more slides you wanted to show before we closed out? I do have a few more slides, and they kind of relate to that last comment about the the quantities. I, I'm a numbers person, and I've been working on this. Uh, software um, that would uh, track all the water, it would enable you to account for all the water from every source that crossed the property boundaries. So rainwater, um, metered water, water going down the sewer, water recharging the groundwater. And uh, there, this is the graph. Oh, and then you can do scenarios. This is a before and after. After. So this is metered water usage before um, and then after, and then water that's transpired, rainwater that's transpired by plants and uh, before and after, and you can see that this has grown maybe 20% or something, uh, and then run on utilized by plants. So uh, every landscape that I've worked on, the capture and infiltrate 100% of the water. And uh, I realized on this particular landscape that there was a bunch of under unutilized infiltration capacity. So it actually captures um, a few hundred thousand gallons a year of run on as well. Um, this is the gray water reuse, indoor rainwater use for uh, laundry and toilet flushing and then efficiency from fixtures. So you can see you have a way more diverse, resilient um, water budget profile here. And you know this in itself is pretty interesting inside the property boundaries, but then look at the water commons effects. So our whole infrastructure is developed under con conditions that incentivize internalizing um, benefits and externalizing costs. You take the fresh water in, you just dump the sewage and stormwater for the uh, community to deal with. So this looks at uh, thousands of or gallons per year, and this is net community water use. So that's how much water you take in through the meter versus how much you recharge to the groundwater. So this house was using a net of, it looks like, about 180,000 gallons a year. And then after infiltrating all the rain and run on, it's uh, got a net of positive almost half a million gallons a year. The runoff that the uh, community has to deal with was around 150,000. Now there's about half a million gallons less that are going down and causing flooding uh, in the flatlands below. The amount of sewer water that the sewage treatment plant has to process has gone down dramatically. Um, and this is kind of an interesting one. Because of the food grown on site, there's irrigation water saved off site. So the missing water that Jay pointed out in the Central Valley could be partly offset, um, uh, actually significantly offset. There's about 70,000 gallons there. And then there's similar effects for the climate co commons, the reduction in carbon footprint, um, carbon offsite from on-site, energy production, plant matter diverted from the landfill. So those were some of the other slides that I wanted to share. Uh, getting near our end of time, is it not? That's right. Um, so I think at this point I want to say thank you. We did get a, a further question um, regarding scaling these systems up for urbanized areas is for multifamily areas and, and what the models for that are. And I think that's something that has come up in our last two webinars, and, and we're going to hold that question for today, but perhaps we can address that in a future webinar uh, since it, it has come up several times as a topic. So you may hear from me um, as we try to figure that one out. Um, but I did just want to say a huge thank you um, to Art Ludwig and to Larry Fay. You guys are amazing. This was a wonderful presentation, and I think it gave us a lot to be inspired by. Hopefully we'll stop crying wolf and we'll come up with some system solutions. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you again so much for that. And I also just wanted to let everybody know that um, we are continuing this webinar series on October 16th. 
with the topic regulating and regulation in California's tightening drinking water standards. Where do we draw the line? So hopefully this has whetted your appetite for that topic on October 16th. Uh, we encourage you to spread the word, and we encourage you to go back to our website and look at some of our past webinars. We've had some really amazing topics, um, and you know we're, we're continuing to build that library. So thank you again uh, to Art and to Larry and to Angelo for this wonderful topic today, and uh, we'll look forward to talking with you guys soon. Thank, thank you. you. It's been our pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.